The 1990s saw incredible change in almost every aspect of American culture. By the time Bill Clinton was sworn in as the 42nd president in 1993, Vanilla Ice had given us Ice Ice Baby, Seinfeld had given us a show about nothing, and a man named Tim Berners-Lee had given us the public World Wide Web, although others would take credit for it. America grew by almost 33 million people during the 1990s, the largest increase of any decade in history. While Will Smith was getting jiggy with it, and George Clooney, aka Dr. Doug Ross, was running the nation's most popular ER, real-life health care was a hot topic on the legislative calendar, and talk of health care reform permeated the halls of Congress. By the end of the 1990s, more than 280 million people were living in the United States, and the population was getting older, which added to the nation's health care costs. Murphy Brown, Bart Simpson, and the Spice Girls may have been influencing fashion, creating catchphrases, and making up words, but Richard Wenzel, Elaine Larson, and Carla Alvarado were impacting healthcare in ways that are still being felt 20 years later. Richard Wenzel has used his career to fight infectious disease, sometimes one patient at a time, and sometimes on a global scale, through his textbooks, scientific publications, and offering counsel to international health agencies. The professor and former chair of the Department of Internal Medicine at Virginia Commonwealth University Medical Center, Wenzel is also a past president of the International Society for Infectious Diseases and has authored more than 480 scientific publications, including six textbooks and a book of essays in medicine. Dr. Wenzel was an important part of the changes in infection prevention during the 1990s, and his impact continues today. Elaine Larson, recently quoted in the New York Times as the hand-washing expert, has been a loyal APIC member since the 1980s and is committed to the merging of science and the clinical practice of infection prevention and control. She is currently the Associate Dean for Research and Anna C. Maxwell Professor of Nursing Research at Columbia University School of Nursing. She has authored more than 250 journal articles, four books, and a number of book chapters in the areas of infection prevention, epidemiology, and clinical research. Dr. Larson's research in hand hygiene and compliance have put her at the forefront of the implementation science movement to promote better health and health care. In the 1990s, she served in multiple APIC leadership roles, including being appointed editor of the American Journal of Infection Control, where she continues to lead the charge in dissemination and implementation science for infection prevention and control. Carla Alvarado has served as an infection control professional for 19 years at the University of Wisconsin Hospitals and Clinics after receiving her MS in Preventative Medicine Epidemiology and her PhD from the university. Dr. Alvarado is well known for her publications and research in nosocomial infections associated with medical devices, safety culture, safety climate, intensive care, and healthcare acquired infections, as well as hand hygiene. She has served on the APIC Board of Directors, been a member of the American Hospital Association Technical Advisory Panel on Infections in Hospitals, and a member of the Board of Trustees for the Research Foundation for Complications Associated with Healthcare. Dr. Alvarado continues her impact on healthcare as a research scientist emerita at University of Wisconsin Center for Quality and Productivity Improvement and UW School of Medicine and Public Health. The 1990s were a time for growth. America experienced more changes than Ross and Rachel's relationship, and healthcare changed with it. The television public was obsessed with being a millionaire, and Carla Alvarado, Elaine Larson, and Richard Wenzel were making sure that the current battle for patient safety was not healthcare's final answer. Dick, I wanted to ask you, um, I, I saw on there uh, microbe <laughs> Smasher, yes. yes. Um, you have you have really in in your career impacted one patient at a time, but also that that global impact. And so I'd like you to share a little bit about that journey. Sure, I was very fortunate. My whole career, I've been very lucky, surrounded by talented people, particularly a large group of fellows. And the 1990s was an awesome period of opportunity for me. I think would make it uh, really exciting was the wonderful fellows that I had, first of all, our emphasis on a high-performance team, and then the emphasis also on communication. Let me expound a little bit. So uh, we had fellows from all over the world, and uh, I'd love to tell you I selected them, hand-selected them, uh, as with all the uh, nurses I've also trained, but the truth is our field selects for talent, highly driven people, they're high achievers. And I was very fortunate as I was building a, a, a knowledge base for people to read about, as well as textbooks. Um, 
Uh, along the way, I think it's really important, as we had people from Mexico, and I, I remember walking down the street and seeing Siegfriedo Rangel from Mexico, Mike Edmond from uh, West Virginia, Didier Pate from Geneva. I said, I'm not sure this is gonna work. <laughs> um, but in fact, they're wonderful friends, in part because of the intense time they spent together. We'd have seven to 10 fellows at a time. And uh, we'd work hard, we'd play hard. Uh, they weren't competing with each other. Each one had, uh, they were working on a degree, master's degree in epidemiology. They all had an epidemic they were working on. And additionally, they all had a problem in the hospital uh, that they were working on a research project. So I thought, well, they'll work hard, they'll play hard. And I thought, well, they live intensely, you know, eight, 10, 12 hours a day. And we'll also try to have some parties where we'll get together. One of the early experiences, I learned something. So I said, well, we'll have a party. We'll, we'll bring about 100 people, the nurses, the lab people, administrators, um, and for fun, we'll have a karaoke. And because <laughs> we have a lot of talent. And so I thought, well, this will be good. The talented people will be there. Well, the karaoke lady surprised me. So she got up and said uh, on the announcement, well, we're very fortunate, Dick Wenzel's gonna do the first song. Uh, well, you know, I have an acoustic guitar and I sing, but I have to be fair, my voice is like Bob Dylan with a respiratory infection. And so I knew I was in trouble. So she says, and we've selected him to sing uh, a song, Daniel. Well, she pushed the button and it was a key that I couldn't hit if I was in 11 years old, you know. <laughs> So I knew I was in for a little trouble. I said, what the heck, two verses, I can survive this. <laughs> well, about verse three, 100 people were pointing at me. And then they were guffawing by five, and I had never seen those words before. And by verse seven, they were tears rolling down their eyes, you know, looking at this. And I thought, oh my God, you know, I survived this. But there was something good that happened as the fellows got to know me as a real person. Um, uh, so later on, uh, one of the things that I think was important was just the emphasis on communication. And you know, as we see in the audience here, most infection practitioners, uh, you, you were women. Half of my fellows were women, but half were men. And they hadn't worked a lot with women. And many of the hospital administrators were women. So one well-meaning fellow came up to me and he said, you know, I just spent 45 minutes talking to an administrator and I don't think she understood anything. I used all the logic, uh, hard arguments, um, but I got a kind of a cool reception. I said, well, let me put it this way. About, there are a lot of paradoxes in life. Um, you remember the first philosophy course you taught, you, you rather you went to? There was this old um, conundrum. If a, if a tree falls in the forest um, and there's no one around to hear it, does it make a sound? Well, the new version is, if a man walks in a forest by himself and expresses his opinion, and there's no woman around to hear it, is he still wrong? <laughs> so, uh, I, you know, so it turns out there were some flaws in his presentation anyway, but the point was, you know, to listen more and do more. So if I were to summarize, I'd say, um, we're very fortunate. The field selects for talent. And I had 50 fellows, we trained you know, thousands of nurses. And I think I was the lucky one. Um, in terms of playing hard and working hard, I really believe in high performance teams where you live together intensely. And if you want to reference Katzenbach and Smith, the wisdom of teams where I learned a lot about how, how important time together is. Now, it helps to get a singing lesson here and there. Yeah. Uh, that'll, that'll go without saying. And then a lot of emphasis on communication. Well, and I think Elaine is one of those women. <laughs> um, can you tell us about your early research and publications around hand hygiene? Sure. Actually, I want to start with an anecdote that I, I actually had cited in 1997 for my Carol DeMille Award. And it, it struck me when I read this in a newspaper, it was a 75-year-old woman who had been taunted all of her married life by her husband, who bragged about how many women he'd had and what a study was and how uh, attractive he was. And he was then in his 80s and infirm, and she was his caretaker. 
but he kept taunting her. And finally, apparently, she'd had it. This was actually in the newspaper, I read. And so she beat him to death with his, with his pla plastic bedpan. <laughs> so I thought about that, and I thought, you know, it's not a nice thing she did, but you got to admire her inventiveness. And often in infection uh, prevention, I feel like we have to use tools in different ways and in new ways. And so, you know, that segs very well into hand hygiene. In the 1980s, I think it was, CDC actually wrote a, a short first guideline about hand hygiene, but then they kind of went out of the business of writing guidelines for a while. And so when I went on to, to school to get my uh, doctorate, in the epi department, I told them that I wanted to do my research on hand hygiene, and my advisor said, well, you, you can't. It's not epidemiology. There's no research we need to do. We know all, of, all the stuff we need to know. So I was able to sort of articulate enough of a rationale so that they allowed me to do some research on that. And in the mid-1990s, um, we published uh, the first paper that I know of in North America on using alcohol instead of a traditional surgical scrub. Well, at that time, I never, I never in a million years thought that things would change because hand washing was kind of like a holy grail and we talked about it a lot. I'm not sure we ever really did much about it, but we talked about it. Um, anyway, so the, the group I remember that was the most critical of that idea was the infection prevention group, uh, us. Um, and I was very worried at the time. It was kind of risky because I was getting a lot of criticism and the, the criticism was, well, if we start using alcohol hand sanitizer, nobody will wash their hands. And I'm thinking, yeah, if it's better, it's okay. <laughs> and it was sort of the old uh, analogy of um, you know, being in the train business rather than being in the transportation business. So what, what I feel is that hand washing, hand hygiene is just a process. It's not an outcome. And if it isn't working, we got to figure out new ways to use those old tools. And frankly, right now, I'm not sure it's working because we have become so concerned about monitoring hand hygiene, a lot of the reason is because we're mandated to do it, that we really forget that unless it's making a difference in the outcome, let's not get focused on these processes, let's reinvent it in, an, in a new way. So I did want to say that I was just curious to see, because really when, when we started doing a lot of research in the 90s in hand hygiene, how much was actually being published at that time? So I went through AGIC and I went through, I looked at articles that had either hand washing or hand hygiene in the title. So in the entire decade of the 1990s, there were 16 articles in AGIC on hand hygiene. In the 2000s, there were 83 in the entire decade. And in the last two and a half years in AJIC, there are 80. Wow. So there's a huge you know, resurgence of interest. But we've got to move now beyond just, you're supposed to do this, we're going to do an in-service. And we've got to really change the whole culture. And that is hard. It takes a long time. And if we don't invent this tool in a new way, we're going to get angry. We're going to get depressed and we're not gonna be effective. Yeah, no, that, very, very true, very, very true. And I know um, some of your buds here are partners in crime in, <laughs> in this process. Carla has uh, contributed a lot in, in the beginning of your work, really sparked by identifying device-related infections. And I'm wondering if you can share a little insight into that process and how, how your story got started. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I think it's still morning, isn't it? Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I actually came into infection prevention, infection control as a fluke. 
My husband got a job at the University of Wisconsin as an assistant professor, and back in those days in the 70s, you were the wife, therefore you looked for work when you got to wherever you were going. There were no <laughs> dual hires back then. So I was interviewed by a young physician who had just arrived at the University of Wisconsin from Harvard, and he's, I am not a nurse, by the way. For those of you who do not know, I am a microbiologist originally. And he said, I already have a nurse. And uh, indeed, because she hired him. Re the great Rita McCormick hired Dennis Mackey. <laughs> I was Dennis Mackey's first hire. And he said, we're going to work on nosocomial infection. And I couldn't get out of there fast enough to look up what it was. <laughs> I had no clue. But I thought, well, this could be fun. He seems nice. We were, we were all in one room. My desk was the top of the specimen freezer. So when you had to get a specimen, I had to clear my desk. As it turns out, that was a forcing function probably I would use today to keep my desk clean. Oh. <laughs> but in saying that, uh, I was very interested in devices and the microbiology associated with devices, and we were doing a lot of IV research and things like that, so I got to do the medical microbiology I enjoyed. Pretty soon then I moved out onto the floor with Rita and uh, learned about infection prevention from the nursing and clinical side, which was just great. Uh, in the process, endoscopes came into vogue, the flexible endoscope. Mm -hmm. And we bought, because we're big into equipment, we bought uh, some automated endoscope reprocessors, the scope machines, as you would commonly call it. And one morning at a uh, staff meeting, Mackey said, so how are those machines? I said, beats me. I don't know. I never go to the GI clinic. <laughs> and he said, well, why don't you go check on them? So I went down and I took the obligatory samples and brought them back and they were filled with Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And then I went and I tested our scopes, and they were filled with Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And then we started to look back in the microbiological specimens, and guess what? Patients, especially that had had ERCP, were filled with Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And I delved into it, I called the company. The company said, I think it's a Wisconsin problem. <laughs> okay, we'll go with that. And this is first take home message. Never throw away your isolates. Always hang on to them because you may find a use for them in an outbreak. And secondly, meet people here this week because you never know when they will come back into your lives and play a significant role. I called colleagues across the United States and asked if they had problems and because they had the same reprocessing machines. And they said, gee, I don't know. Maybe we do, I don't know. They took samples and they had organisms in the machines. And at the time it was uh, at large medical centers, you saved your bloodborne isolates, your bacteria associated with bacteremias and septicemias, you save them. I don't know if people do now. I'm out of the day-to-day -day practice. Yeah. But then they did. And this could not happen today, I don't think, without having some sort of federal mandate. But they mailed me their bacteria. <laughs> they put them in transport media, in tubes, and they sent patient A, patient B, patient C, machine one, two, three, they sent them to me. And what we came upon was not only a nationwide, but a worldwide outbreak associated with these automated endoscope reprocessing devices. They were poorly designed from a microbiological standpoint because they were designed by engineers that knew nothing about infection prevention and microbiology. And that began my career in a way to try and understand a systems approach, which as some of you know, I later went and got a PhD in systems engineering and that's sort of my focus now. But without the help of the APIC colleagues that were willing to send me their isolates, I might have taken the answer it's a, a Wisconsin problem. <laughs> but it turned out to be a California problem, a Minnesota problem, a Washington State problem. It was 
everywhere they sent me isolates. Yeah. They weren't all the same bug. Because we went further, and uh, due to Dr. Mackey's forethinking, we did genomic DNA testing. We started fingerprinting in our research lab. You know, we were sort of the CSI of uh, <laughs> infection prevention at the time. And the bugs were different throughout the country, but they were a dead-on fingerprint match between patients and machine. It wow. was the first DNA source outbreak published in a major medical journal associated with devices. And I want to give a big thank you to Julia Garner and Bill Martone and the decennial group for publishing that. Because at the time, no journal would take that article because it talked about major manufacturing flaws. It is a different era now. Now we can talk about major, major manufacturing flaws, but that back then, no journal published it. But the CDC backed it, and they did it, and it was a great hour. And one other thing on APIC's side, CDC went out of the business of publishing guidelines for a period of time. APIC picked up the ball and filled that gap. And in the process, a professor from North Carolina, Bill Rutala, came on the scene with disinfection and sterilization. And he found that label claims on one very large supplier of sterile disinfectant did not perform to what they claimed. FDA wouldn't touch it. CDC couldn't touch it. It wasn't their role. But Rutala stood by the science, and APIC backed him and said, we go down if you go down, and we sail if you sail. And that, I think, was one of APIC's proudest hours, wow. that they stood up, the product didn't work, <laughs> and they backed Dr. Ritala. And uh, we were an advocate for good science and good practice. Oh, and you have a favorite rule, don't you? Yes, I do have a favorite <laughs> rule. And it, uh, today, uh, I think most of the associated device-related problems follow what I call the Jerry Maguire rule. Engineering design is quite good today. Testing is quite good today. We, we don't get a lot of manufacturing flaws today. But what we do get uh, are two things. One, biofilm. We have a better understanding of biofilm associated with devices. And two, it's the Jerry Maguire rule. Show me the money. And when you see these outbreaks associated with devices, step back, take a systems look. Where are people cutting corners? Where are, as our movie this morning showed us, where are they reusing devices that shouldn't be reused? Where are, in the manufacturing process, people cutting corners or changing product manufacturing, changing good manufacturing practices to save money? Everyone is under time crunch and money crunch. Yeah. And where are, the, where are the corners cut? Where are the mistakes, the latent errors in the system popping out? It's my Jerry Maguire rule, show me the money. Yeah. <laughs> and once you see the money, then you go at where it may be part of the root cause. And a last message, when I presented the outbreak of endoscopes, uh, the first place I was asked to present was to the FDA in Rockville, Maryland. And I was scared to death because I had worked with Dennis Mackey when he had to go to trial based on that Abbott outbreak that he and the boys of summer, as I call them, that CDC <laughs> group uh, of Raymond Goldman and Mackey and uh, Don, the late Don Mackle and that whole group, they had to go to trial concerning this. And to say they were harassed would be an understatement. It was not a bright scene to be an EIS officer testifying in that trial. Uh, it was very difficult. And I didn't want this. I said, oh no, I'm, too, I'm frightened by this. And Mac has said, first of all, it's a different time, but just tell me this. Are you telling the truth? Is your science good? What are you afraid of? I leave this message for you. Yeah. You're, gonna, you're gonna have challenges out there, especially you first-timers, your newbies in the field. There will be challenges. 
always remember, are you telling the truth? Is your science good? Then what are you afraid of? Thank you. Oh, awesome. And I'd like an opportunity to thank our 90s difference makers because clearly you can see how they have made a difference. Thank you so much. And we're gonna